Hello and welcome back to the Hasbro Jan YouTube channel. It is Harry here, and today it is time for a brand new series on this channel. Woo! And it is to do with the role of dictators in football. Now you might think, wait, what on earth have dictators got to do with football? Well, actually, quite a lot in some cases. Of course, not every dictator saw football as the most imperative part of society, but a lot did see it as a massively influential force in unifying and controlling the nation and making morale as positive as physically possible amongst its citizens. I thought that, as someone with an interest in historical societies linking into football, it would be a great idea to bring you this new mini-series. For this video, I will be focusing on a relatively high-profile dictator from the 1920s to 1930s who you may have heard of, by the name of Benito Mussolini. I must stress straight off the bat that I vehemently disagree with his policies of you know, anti-Semitism and fascism and things like that. I do find some of his beliefs to be deplorable and morally abhorrent, and I do not condone or associate myself with anyone who thinks along those lines. However, what is interesting to me is just how integral he saw football as part of his mandate and his control over the country, as well as the others whom I will profile in future videos. So without further ado, let's profile Mussolini's involvement with football. Mussolini's rise to power was, in reality, quite quick. He had an epiphany after the war that the only way to cure the problems that Italy were facing, both economically and politically, was to have a dictator put in charge. Someone who had absolute control over the country and unite everyone of its citizens under nationalism and a common goal. His idea of fascism spread around the country and his power and dramatic nature of, while speaking meant that people were taken by his ideas even if what he said was often purported to be false. The right wing has quickly set about preventing any left wing organisation from taking control and after defeating a general strike in 1922, the insurrection finally took place in October of that year with the march on Rome. The fascists weren't stopped by the king despite the government's pleas, perhaps in an attempt to avoid civil war by quelling the threat. And at the end of the month, Mussolini was sworn in as Italy's youngest ever prime minister after the king accepted his demands. He set about eliminating all other political rivals, and by 1924, he had succeeded, pretty much. After a prominent critic of the dictatorship, Giacomo Matteotti, was murdered by a group of fascists, and the remaining political groups walked out of parliament in an attempt to convince Mussolini to step down. However, all it in reality achieved was that Mussolini consolidated his power even more, as there would be no one, of course, to dissent his ideas. At the time when Mussolini came to power, Football was a fledgling sport in Italy, with a clear divide in the league structure at the time. There were two main leagues, one reserved for Italian players exclusively, and the other allowing foreign imports to play for their teams. Furthermore, there wouldn't be a league uniting both the North and the South until 1926, with teams from the South needing to be admitted by the fascist party to the top league so that there was an equal representation, as the North was stronger at football than the South. Even then, the Southern teams still struggled, with Roma only gaining 5 points in Group B and Napoli just 1 in Group A of the 1926-27 season. But they were spared from relegation owing to this need to keep Southern sides in the top division of course to promote the ideals of national unity and cohesion that Mussolini wanted to propagate. In 1929, the league that we know today, Serie A, was established alongside Serie B in order to fully instigate the widespread appeal of football, even though southern teams, as they still continue to do so today, struggle. Mussolini, further in line with his policy of unity under nationalism, nationalised the football teams within the country. Genoa and AC Milan were changed to become their Italian names of Genova and AC Milano, as opposed to their English variants, with Milan, as far as I'm aware, also being told to remove the English flag from their badge. And Internazionale, also known as Inter Milan, had a name that was deemed too global and had to change their name to an Italian saint, Ambrosia. Anglicised terms such as goal kick and corner were removed and roughly translated into Italianized ideas. These translations, however, were quite clunky and none of them survived following Mussolini's downfall in 1943 and death a couple of years later. Furthermore, he brought back Calcio Storico in 1930, a game played on sand with punching and choking both loud, but no attacks to the head after a few deaths had happened, as well as 27 players aside and no substitutions even if a player is seriously injured or killed. This was done as a celebration of Italian masculinity and virility, with Mussolini comparing sports people to our soldiers in the combat. Although Mussolini wasn't by any means a football acolyte, he certainly recognised how imperative it was to the spirits of the country, if their teams developed and did well. 
none more so than the national team. They declined to take part in the 1930 World Cup, but Mussolini frantically set up a campaign to host the next edition in 1934. The stadium were constructed at a rapid rate in order to show the world that not only could Italy host the tournament, but that their economy and climate was also booming under Mussolini's rule. And many of the stadia, including Torino's ground, still stand today. He got his wish and Italy defeated Sweden in order to gain the hosting rights. And immediately, as one might expect, there was a lot of controversy. England, widely regarded as the greatest team of that era, had played Italy a year earlier. But amidst the fascist backdrop in support of Mussolini, who was present at the 1-1 draw, they declined to take part in the tournament alongside a couple of other matters, including payment rights to amateurs. Uruguay, winners in 1930, had suffered an economic crash and couldn't afford to take part, becoming the only nation not to defend their title. And Argentina, losing finalists four years earlier, sent an amateur side to Italy in protest over the Italians taking some of their players. This particular element was key in Mussolini's hegemony over football in Italy at the time. Three players, namely Enrique Haida, Raimondo Orsi and Luis Monti, who'd actually played in the 1930 World Cup final, switched allegiances from Argentina to Italy, as Mussolini wanted to have the best possible squad going into the tournament. They were nicknamed Oriundi, meaning immigrants with a native origin. Whilst Italy most certainly had a strong squad, make no mistake about it, boasting the likes of Giuseppe Miazza, after whom the San Siro is officially named, and Silvio Piola, who was one of the top scorers in the 1938 World Cup, these players merely added to the strength and depth that they could boast. Of course, you might be thinking that this counteracted Italy's aspirations as a nationalised team, considering they weren't officially Italian, but they gained citizenship in order to play. Furthermore, as Greg Lear argues, they were simply a representation of Italian diaspora and aims to colonialise the world under their rule. Although it is rumoured that they were denied medals from the Italian government after the tournament had been completed. Italy's first game of the 1934 World Cup saw them dispatch the hapless USA 7-1, but Mussolini then set about his greatest acts of footballing subterfuge. Before the quarterfinal against Spain, Mussolini allegedly wined and dined the referee for that game, who permitted foul play by Italy on many occasions and oversaw a win for the Azzurri. He did the same thing again with Ivan Eklund, in the build-up to the semi-final against Austria's Wunder team. The Italians scored a dodgy last-minute winner, and in spite of the Austrians' attempts to cry foul, their pleas fell on deaf ears and Italy were in the final. In it, they faced Czechoslovakia, and they won 2-1 as a result of a stunning goal from Odyssey, don't forget he was one of their Oriundi, which equalised the game up in the 81st minute, and Miazza's winning goal during the extra half-hour period. Mussolini was delighted to reward his players with the Jules Rimet trophy, as well as the Coppa del Duce, his own insignia on the tournament, a trophy which was apparently six times the size of the original Jules Rimet trophy. Of course, he was very leery of the allegations labelled against him, especially when England played Italy at Highbury in 1934, and in a physical and violent game emerged as 3-2 winners. Their triumph in the 1936 Olympics in Berlin was a step in the right direction, but Mussolini already had his eyes set on the 1938 tournament in France, desperate for the team to win so that he could prove that the success in 1934 wasn't a fluke and or down to jiggery pokery. The team was greeted upon arrival in France by anti-fascist activists, but the players, as the manager Vittorio Pozzo claimed, weren't interested in the political side of things, but solely the sporting side. It later emerged that Pozzo was an anti-fascist activist himself, but potentially pardoned as a result of his successes with the national team. Nevertheless, the team still gave the fascist salute pre-matches, and in the quarterfinal against France, in an already politically charged atmosphere, Mussolini enforced them to wear black, as their blue clashed with France's blue in allegiance with his Black Shirts movement, which had taken over the government 16 years prior. Although not as technically gifted, they were physically prepared and wild machines, beating Norway and France in order to set up a showdown in the semi-finals with Brazil. Brazil was so confident that they'd already booked their hotel for the final itself, but their confidence was destroyed to bits by the Italians, who beat them to set up a final with Hungary, whom they beat 4-2 to claim their second World Cup in a row. They returned as national heroes, receiving an audience with Mussolini, who saw his Italy becoming sporting powerhouses after Gino Bartali won the Tour de France and the Côte Niarco won the Grand Prix de Paris. Mussolini ultimately achieved his sporting goal, in a sense that Italy were at the forefront of not just club football, but also on the international stage, which was his primary aim. Even if it took some bribery, threats and extremely fascist sentiments to get there, 
he completed at least one part of what he had set out to do when he took power in 1922. He must have foreseen a long era of Italian supremacy, both politically and on the sporting stage too. But in 1943, the country collapsed in the war effort and Mussolini was deposed in a new wave of anti-fascist acts. Mussolini ended up being shot in April 1945, two days before Hitler's suicide, and his body was hung upside down and attacked by various anti-fascists. Italy wouldn't win another international trophy until 1968, and the World Cup would elude them until 1982, 37 years after Il Duce's death. So that pretty much concludes this video. I really hope you found it educational. Please give the video a like if you enjoyed it. Comment down below with what you think and also maybe who else I should cover if, of course, they had an interest in football of some kind. And subscribe if you're new around here because, of course, I have a lot more videos on the way. But until next time, I'll see you then.